First Jesuit Pope. Never expected in a million years that a Jesuit would step out as Pope. First Pope of the Americas. The Catholic Church has its first ever non-European Pope. And first Pope to take the name Francis. He wasn't, so to speak, on the short list. He spoke in this very kind of humble and conversational tone, a little bit grandfatherly. Jorge Mario Bergoglio was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina in 1936. His parents were Italian immigrants, and he's the oldest of five children. Only one of his siblings, Maria Elena Bergoglio, is still living. He studied in high school to become a chemical technician, and he also allegedly had a crush on a woman named Amalio de Monte, who shortly after he was named Pope, told the press that he said to her, if we don't get married, I'll become a priest. They did not get married, and he did become a priest. On March 11, 1958, he entered the novitiate of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. For the next 10 years, he studied and taught humanities, philosophy, theology, literature, and even psychology. On December 13, 1969, Jorge Bergoglio, at 32 years old, was ordained a priest. In 1973, just four years after being ordained, he became provincial of the Jesuits in Argentina. He was consecrated a bishop in 1992, and after the death of Cardinal Antonio Corosino, the man who consecrated Bergoglio and wanted him as a close collaborator for many years, Jorge Bergoglio was named Archbishop of Buenos Aires in 1998. Three years later, in 2001, Pope John Paul II created him Cardinal. I would say the most telling uh, position that he supported, which foreshadowed the liberalism of his pontificate, is that he supported gay civil unions in Argentina. The uh, Argentinian Bishops' Conference was debating how to respond to the country's embrace of gay marriage, and Jorge Bergoglio uh, proposed that they uh, accept a middle course and that they endorse gay civil unions, which he himself did. But uh, the Argentinian Bishops' Conference rejected his suggestion, and uh, and they they opposed not only gay marriage but also gay civil unions. What we're seeing in Pope Francis today is really no different than the, the younger Francis. Uh, you know, we're, we're just seeing the, um, uh, the culmination of the leftism that he was uh, shaped by in Argentina. Pope, now Saint, John Paul II, died in 2005. And in the following conclave, reports claim it was Bergoglio who received the second most votes behind Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI. A glorious day here in Rome where history is being made today. We are seeing the final hours of a living Pope, Benedict XVI. Seven years later, in a move that shook the world, Pope Benedict announced he would resign the throne of Peter at the end of February. The first Pope to do so since Pope Gregory XII in the early 1400s. Less than two weeks later, March 13th, 2013, White smoke poured from the chimney of the Sistine Chapel, and Jorge Bergoglio walked out onto the loggia as Pope Francis. But it was who, what other cardinals walked out onto the loggia with him, that immediately raised concerns among faithful Catholics. It's customary that cardinals who most champion the cause for election of the eventual pontiff are the ones who stand closest to him as he is first presented to the city and the world. Out on the loggia, directly to Francis's left, were Cardinals Claudio Umez of Brazil and Godfrey Daniels of Belgium. Umez, the man who was in charge of the Amazon Synod in 2019 and also led the Pact of the Catacombs, a commitment signed by 40 others covered with newspeak of eco-socialism like Mother Earth global warming, and integral ecology. It was also Umez who, right after the election, hugged and kissed Francis and told him, don't forget the poor, which resulted in Francis taking his name after St. Francis of Assisi, who loved the poor. The other man on the loggia with Francis, Cardinal Godfrey Daniels, who spoke favorably in 2013 of the legalization of gay marriage in Belgium, telling a Dutch newspaper, I think it is a positive development that states are free to open civil marriage to gays if they want to. Daniels also was caught in 2010, telling a sex abuse victim to shut up and not go public. This was the 13-year-old nephew of Daniels' close friend, Roger Van Helu, 
Archbishop of Bruges, who had been molesting the boy since he was five years old and stepped down as bishop because of the scandal. Since his papacy, Pope Francis has received support from the political and the theological left because of their shared views on climate change and globalism. In 2016, Pope Francis uh, was discussed by Leonardo Boff, who said that Francis is one of us. Uh, Leonardo Boff is considered the father or the grandfather of cultural Marxism uh, called the Liberation Theology Movement. Uh, in 2018, Pope Francis sent him a letter on the occasion of his 80th birthday. Uh, and in that letter, he said that he recalled their first encounter in San Miguel during the years 1972 and 1975. And then what's interesting is that in 2019, Leonardo Boff posted a picture of Jorge Bergoglio and himself at a Liberation Theology Conference that took place in February of 1972. So his ties with the Liberation Theology movement are very deep. One of his biggest campaigns has been climate change. He's dedicated numerous publications to the supposed issue, his most famous being the encyclical Laudato Si, On Care for Our Common Home. Climate change is a global problem with grave implications. Listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, who suffer most because of the unbalanced ecology. He's joined arms with the United Nations in this supposed fight. The United Nations platform consists of spreading abortion, contraception, euthanasia, and more, all to solve the so-called problem of overpopulation, which scientists, funded by the left, claim is responsible for man-made climate change. And the reason that they're centering around the environment, why they want environmentalism to be that ri rallying cry, is so that they can have all of humanity say, this is something that affects us all, so we need to get together in order to implement this plan and this plan and this plan, because that's the only way we're going to save ourselves. As of late, in response to the Wuhan virus pandemic, he said this may be one of nature's responses to climate change. The mission of the church is not to save the planet, it's to save souls. And so you would think that the Pope would, you know, keep his eye on that objective and, and not join a movement that is defined by a um, anti-Catholicism. Pope Francis has been outspoken against populism, saying that it could produce a new Hitler suggesting that populist leaders or nationalist leaders like U.S. President Donald Trump fit the bill. Populism is the growing movement pushing back against an elitist push toward globalism, globalism being the international alignment of political forces moving toward one world government and the partial surrender of national identities. The purpose of using the environment, uh, because um, Marxism has always been implemented through some sort of rallying point. In the early 20th century, the late 19th century, it was all about the workers. Now they have to find something that's going to unite all of humanity for their globalist agenda. And that united rallying cry is environmentalism because it affects everybody. And at the end of the day, they want to create what, uh, what they would call a paradise on earth, a, a humanist materialist paradise without God. In May of 2019, Francis addressed the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences saying, the national state is no longer able to procure the common good for its populations alone. The common good has become worldwide and nations must unite for their own benefit. Much of the globalist minded agenda of the Pope and his cohorts have been unveiled little by little, as much by suggestion as by outright embracing. For example, during the Pope's visit to Bolivia in 2015, former Bolivian President Evo Morales gave Pope Francis a hammer and sickle, the international sign of Marxist communism, with the corpus of our Lord on it, a sculpture which caused no end of upset in the Catholic world. Jorge Bergoglio had a communist mentor, Esther Balestrina, and she, she, uh, she was his uh, uh, boss at a laboratory in, in Buenos Aires, which he worked at when he was in his late teens. And the Pope himself has said that this communist had an enormous influence on his political education, that she introduced him to communist newspapers, communist literature, uh, that she introduced him to the issues uh, that communists were discussing. And he, he has said that um, her understanding of social justice as a communist was uh, helpful to him as a Catholic because 
he said that um, what she found in communism, he was able to find in the church's social justice tradition. Fue jefa mía del laboratorio donde yo trabajaba de análisis químico y además una mujer que me enseñó a trabajar y a ser exacto en los análisis hacia la parte de glicerinas esas cosas no sobre todo un bromatológico me enseñó a trabajar bien científicamente y a ser una mujer de mucho humor una mujer que me inició en el conocimiento de la política me hacía leer cosas los artículos de Barleta, por ejemplo, y, y los hablábamos y los comentábamos. Le debo mucho a esa mujer. Después, siendo yo cura y todo, mantuvimos la relación. Me acuerdo como una gran mujer y... En 2019, el Amazon Synod dio una plataforma a pro-abortion advocates y pagan worship, todo en el Vaticano, y todo en el nombre de solidaridad con la agenda de cambio climático. Aunque el Pope Francis ha comparado abortion a hiring a hitman, compare gender ideology to the annihilation of human beings and recognize the family is being severely threatened by the attempt to redefine marriage, his allegiance with the political left and its globalist agenda allows for a continued partnership making a one world order center stage. As Archbishop Vigano pointed to as an agenda very dangerous to the life of the church.